Okay, it's the end of the session. This is Bruiser. Art. This is Art. Sit. That's a very good sit. This is the roadmap to success. Most of us talk way too much to our dogs. So when the dog does what we want, if we're going to pet them, we want to say just the command word. Not good dog, not good, not art sit, just sit. The guardian is rolling her eyes a little bit behind the camera for me, but that's just kind of how it makes it easier for dogs to learn. The more words we use, the harder it is for them to pick out which word. We say between 2,000 and 11,000 words a day as humans. So if I got to listen through 11,000 words for this one, uh, for a whole bunch of different words, most of us say come here, come here, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, dog's nickname. Now I've got like 10 different things I've got to listen to. And if you speak English, they may all mean the same thing. To a dog, they mean complete, they're completely separate command words. So the more words we say, the harder it is for them to understand. Just ask yourself, is it easy to remember 10 words? Sit. Or 100 words. So if we have 10, uh, 10 commands and each one has 10 command expressions, that's a lot of vocabulary to listen to. All right, so um, very much so, uh, these are, we have a terrier and a doxy, and they are both high energy dogs. So the first thing we talked about uh, was exercise. So uh, it, it's Nebraska, it's not gonna be a fun time of the year. The Guardian here does a really, really important job and really long hours, unfortunately, to come with it. And so the dogs uh, have kind of their area downstairs so they can kind of, that we're gonna go with that for now. Uh, but basically the dogs are in, in an area uh, where there can be safe. You don't want to kennel a dog for longer than four hours. So what the guardian is doing here is awesome. Um, but when we let them out, we're going to follow that video above. And I would like you to do that every single time that you let them out. Crash. Passive training. We'll talk about that in a sec. Now, don't just do it when you leave. Every once in a while, put one of the dogs downstairs. After about five minutes, put, you know, or put it outside uh, downstairs. Go outside with the other dog to do a little potty and then leave that dog outside if it's safe to do so, and then come back in and practice that exercise. Don't just wait for when you're leaving, coming and going, because typically we have busy lives. Maybe you have a hot day, and then you got, you're got you hurrying. Well, then you're gonna be frustrated the dogs are taking longer to calm down. Well, if you have like five minutes, take one of them outside for a potty break, put the other one back there first, then go out for the potty break, uh, leave that dog outside, come in, and do repeat that exercise. What you're gonna see is the more you practice it, the faster that they're gonna learn to calm themselves down, and the quicker they're gonna calm themselves down. And remember, you're not saying calm down. We're not saying sit. We're not saying anything. We're just saying when you're calm, you're attractive. I want to let you out. I start the process. As soon as you get excited, it stops the process. Now, um, one of the things of exercise that I went over, one of the uh, uh, creative ways of exercise, is to throw the treats up and down the stairs. So again, I would do this separately with only one dog. Show the dog you have the treat. Take the treat, throw it to the bottom of the stairs with the dog looking. When the dog runs down the stairs, when it licks it up, come up with a fun word that means to go down south. Call it like Bermuda, Cancun, whatever. Some word that means to go to the south. Um, <laughs> there you go, buddy. Yeah, you're going to bomb the camera a little bit. Uh, he's a cutie. We get, we're going to let him. And that's sometimes when we have cute dogs, we let them get away with things that we wouldn't in other capacities, and that can be confusing for them. Conf uh, us not being consistent is one of the most confusing things that a human could do for dogs. Mm -hmm. Sit. Now you're sitting together and be a great picture, but we're now we're, my camera's already busy. Okay, so for the for the stairs, and this is something that you're gonna do a ton. Anytime that they are quote unquote naughty or mischievous or playing too rambunctiously, that should be your indication. I need to get them a little exercise. Remember, dogs sleep your size probably sleep about 14 hours a day. When they're asleep, they're recharging their batteries, they need to burn that energy. Ah, uh -uh. that was we were about to mount. Remember, anything your dog is doing when you pet it or give it attention to what you're rewarding, it, but anything they do in your presence that you don't specifically disagree with, you're saying that has my seal of approval. So if I don't want the dogs on the couch, I need to immediately correct the sit, the dog, every time it does it. Now, he likes to hump uh, Art. Uh, 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 I want to say Bowser again. Uh, uh, Bruiser. Bruiser. Um, I've worked with a Bowser. Um, and so uh, that often is interpreted as sexual or dominance and sometimes it's just overstimulated. In his case, I'm pretty sure it's overstimulated. There might be some of the others spilling into it as well. But so when they're playing roughhousing and he starts doing that, that's when they get that time out. Whenever their energy level gets past level five, I like to consider dogs have 10 levels of energy. Zero is asleep, 10 is as crazy as seeing the dogs. So this I would say is maybe for him, maybe a, a, a two or a, you know probably about a two or a three. So uh, sound about right? Or maybe one. You it's what you see him a lot more than I do. I'm t I'm talking to the guardian as she's filming this, but it's whatever you calibrate that to be. So you know what the maximum is. You know what the minimum is. Zero is asleep. So whenever the dogs pass level five energy, they should get an automatic timeout. No, even if they're not being aggressive or there's play has not gotten out of hand, 
What we want them to learn is if I go past level five, I get an automatic timeout and I don't get released until I come back to like a level one energy. If we let them get to level eight or nine energy and they give them that timeout, it's twice the distance. It's gonna take them a lot longer to calm down. Sometimes you won't do it. You have to actually separate them into different rooms. So if you can catch them at their level four, almost to level five, and give and once they cross the th five threshold, they get that timeout. And after enough timings, they'll just be like, well, let's keep it at 4.9 and less, and the good times will roll. Now, again, exercise is a big component of this. So if they are roughhousing, that should be your interpretation. I want you to interpret that as they're saying loudly, I need some exercise. Put one outside, throw them up and down the stairs or the bedroom, whatever it is, and then swap the dogs. Remember the first time you do it with uh, an empty stomach, do it with each dog separately and keep on doing it and count each down up as one. Keep doing it until the dog's like, you're crazy. I've been down there 93 times, not going down there anymore. I'm guessing that Art's probably going to be in the like 40 to 80 range. And I'm guessing that uh, uh, Bowser or <laughs> Bowser, uh, Bruiser. Bruiser, I will get it like right when I'm finished with this video, buddy. But I'm guessing Bruiser, he's a Dotsie, so he's not going to have uh, as much stamina probably as the Terrier. We'll see. But that's why we want to max them out the first time with there's no expectations and we know what the maximum number is. When we throw the treat down there, the dog's like, I'm not going down there anymore. Now we know what the maximum number is. So we want to exercise 50 to 75% of the maximum number multiple times a day. Usually best, best of about two to four hours. Or if you're going to have someone come over before a walk, if they're too rambunctious, there are other times to do it as well. And I'm not saying two is, is sufficient. It might be six, whatever it is. But four, you know, probably between the two of them, you're probably going to spend about three to eight minutes tossing the treats on the stairs. That's equivalent to like a half an hour walk for each dog. Now the walks, those are great things to do and we can please do them and do it the way that you're doing. The guardian here is doing a really good job. She lets the dog sniff. Uh, most of us, we want the dog to be moving faster. We think that's the workout, but the locomotion of a walk is, does not burn as much energy as if the dog sniffs on the walk. So that could be a flop. There we go. That's passive training. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, okay, so um, uh, that's a great way to exercise them. Something else you might want to do is get some treat dispensing toys. One of the ones that I like using is an Omega Treat Ball. It looks like a softball that's orange. It has some dimples in it, and it's got a hole with a sleeve on it. You put the dog's kibble in it, the dog has to nudge it just right to get a little piece of kibble to fall up, then they lick it up. Now, when my dogs lick it up, I uh, say the word soccer. So soccer is the command word. I put the ball down and say soccer, they nudge it around like a little Diego Mar Maradona. Um, so basically, uh, <laughs> here we go. Um, sit. sit. Very good. The Guardian and I both did that in stereo. That was awesome. And that would be art. Um, so, puppy, puppy. There we go. We'll get you guys down and redirect you a little bit. Sit, sit. So I say it twice. I say it once during the command stage and once during the reward stage. If the dog doesn't know it for passive training, we're only going to say it during the pass uh, during the second stage, the reward or payment stage. But we're not quite there yet. So, all right. So exercise. Um, some other ones you can get are um, come and um, uh, the omega treat ball is the one I was telling you about. Another one you can get is called a snuffle mat. Remember snuffle up, I guess. And it looks basically like a floor mat with tassels that have an Crash. explosion of, terror, of steroids. And what it is is you put their kibble in there and shake it around, and they've got to use their nose to find the kibble, then move the tassels out of the way and lick it up. It promotes sniffing, which is calming for them. It's relaxing for them. It boosts their self-esteem because they're earning the affection. And you do this every time you feed them without putting any extra effort into you for you. And because they're using their nose, it's very physically draining. So you can make them yourselves if you're DIY. I'm not, unfortunately, very DIY. I just don't have time. But you can order them on Amazon or Chewy. But if you're looking to do it online, do it yourself. Just look for a Snuffle, S-N-U-F-F-L-E, mat. And there's a lot of videos on YouTube that will show you how to do it. Um, but that's a nice way because we it just we get a little exercise, burnt, uh, energy burnt without us having to do a lot. Um, there's other, also scent games. You might want to Google scent games. There's a bunch of articles come uh, that you can use. Oh, I got it. So he's getting a little bit of timeout. He tried to go over and mount his buddy, so you get a timeout. No correction, no punishment. I guess you could consider this a punishment. I just look at it as more of a consequence. Um, I'm not going to let you continue doing that because, again, anything the dog is doing that I don't disagree with, I'm like, I'm cool with that. So he sat down. I'm still holding on. He's kind of, he let go. Uh, he laid down, and I let go, and he's now redirected chewing an antler. Redirecting your dogs is a really powerful thing to do. Um, okay, so sit. Such a handsome fellow. 
Uh, I think he's a Border Terrier uh, Brussels uh, mix, but probably a whole bunch of loud stuff in there, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, walks are also a great way to burn energy, but try to cut right, find out the right combination that works for you. But remember, the days that you have to work where they're going to be downstairs for a long period of time, give them a longer, maybe you max them out, whatever their maximum number is for the fetch. So, and my recommendation for that would be wake up, take them outside to do their business, leave one of the dogs outside, bring the other one in. After it's done a peer pooping, sit. Throw the treats up and down the stairs so that dog, whatever the number is that you're going to do for that dog, then bring that dog, put it in your bedroom or put it outside, bring the other dog in and work with that dog. Once that dog has gotten maxed out or whatever the number that you want to achieve, then leave them here. Then you go start your morning ritual, shower, breakfast, all the rest of that stuff. All right, we also talked about rules and the importance of rules is uh, for key for dogs, especially of more than one dog in a house. Dogs go through life probing, waiting, and expecting for somebody to say that's the limit because they can't communicate verbally. That's how they learn. I'm going to go down this road, and when I get to the next farm, Old McDonald will come out and yell at me, and I know that's where Old McDonald's farm starts. So they're probing, waiting for us to say, yes, that's too far, and the leaders are the ones who enforce the rules. So for uh, the more that we can incorporate some rules and help the dogs see us acting like leaders, the more they're going to respect us like leaders. And once we do that, the world shrinks. They don't think it's their responsibility to bark at whoever's coming by the house or all the rest of this stuff. And a lot of people think, well, I just want to work on barking. The barking comes from a perception of authority. And that's why we enforce these rules. You know, you can be, the dogs can be on the bed with the guardian, but only after the guardian gets in her bed and decides when she's ready, she's fluffed the covers, she's read, she's watched TV, whatever she wants to do. When she's ready, then she invites the dog up and she's like, Art, I have this little section of my bed for you. Sit. And if you don't like it, there's a whole lot of floor for you. It's my bed. And if I'm being generous, this is the portion of my bed I wish to share with you. Crash. And if you don't like it, like I said, I'm not going to punish you, but that's not an option. If someone wants to borrow my car, they can't tell me how they're going to borrow my car. Yeah, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to trick it out. I'm going to drag race. No. If you're going to borrow my car, I want you to drive responsibly uh, and not go too far. No drag racing and bring it back with the same amount of gas that it left. And that's a reasonable expectation. It's the same sort of principle for the dogs. So um, I love how Art has given me great eye contact. We went through a focus and a, uh, a leave it exercise. Now, if I don't have them posted on the webpage that this video is on, please let me know and I can add them in. But it'll be the videos that we go over in our puppy class lesson that teach you how to do it. Those are both exercises. One of the, the leave it is a great impulse control exercise. That, same thing with the door, are great ways for the dog to understand that being calm is what gets me the reward. Being excited doesn't get anything. Uh, the focus exercise is a nice way to redirect the dog's attention. So if you're outside, you see one of your neighbors pulls up in the car, and you say, focus, the dog looks up for you. You pull out some treats and start practicing that focus exercise while your neighbor gets and walks to the house. Well, I'd like to yell at the neighbor, but I'm getting these treats pretty much on tap, and so I'm going to continue doing it. Now, don't use it outside until you've mastered it inside, and the dog can do it for 15 seconds inside and outside with no distractions. Only then should you try to use it if a neighbor or a squirrel or the world's biggest bunny rabbit who lives on the street uh, is coming down the road. Um, so um, the leave it exercise, uh, just follow both of those uh, instructions. I'm not going to go through it in here, but if you have questions on either one of those, please let me know. The only time I get mad with my clients is if they don't call me. If you have a question or problem, I don't care if it's seven years from now, I want you to call me or text me. I don't charge for those things. I want you to know that you've got a resource. If I have to come back, I charge you for my time, but I've got thousands of these videos, uh, like the one that's right above this, I'd be happy to share with you. All right, other rules uh, shouldn't be allowed to uh, be within seven feet of us when we're eating. Actually, before that, we should eat something before we feed them. So eat something in five more bites, then you put the food down. I would like you to have you feeding them one at a time. Now, if you wanna learn how to do structured feeding, I have a video for that. If you go to doggoundproblems.com, click on where it says structured feeding, or uh, uh, click on where it says dog training tips. On the top of the box, uh, if you're looking at a laptop or the bottom of the page, there's a search box. Just type in structured feeding. It'll explain how to do it. It's a video of me doing with like, I think four or five dogs, well, a whole bunch of videos. Uh, but the idea is the dogs develop a little self-control. I wanna eat the food, but I have to stay out of the kitchen because Art is eating, and my job is to stay outside until it's Boozer's turn. Now I would Crash. use that operate awesome. I would use that uh, the same thing you just did there with feeding them. Come up with a unique word for each dog to eat. So when Bruiser eats, maybe we call his you know uh, meatloaf, and when he eats, maybe we call it sushi. Whatever the word is that you want to use. So the idea is, whenever Bruiser is taken first bite of food, he hears the word meatloaf. When Art hears meatloaf, there's no food in his mouth. When Bruiser hears it, there is food in his mouth. Therefore, to Bruiser, meatloaf is my command word to eat. 
to Arden doesn't mean the same thing. So um, uh, I guess before we get into, uh, well, Crash. there we go. Let's talk about passive training and, and petting with a purpose because that's really what we're at, at now. So uh, Bruiser just laid down. The Guardian petted him within three seconds and said the word crash, which is what we're going to use as the word. You can change it to a different word if you don't want to use that. But most of us train our dogs to misbehave because they come to us, we ignore them. They sit in front of us, we ignore them. They lay down and we ignore them. They bring us a toy, we ignore them. Terrier probably brings you a little rat or something, you ignore it. Uh, but as soon as they start barking or humping or jumping up or doing the scratching at the door, we immediately give them corrections. Well, for dogs, good attention and bad attention is pretty much the same thing. So that is a good way to train the dog to do exactly what you don't want, the opposite of what you want, matter of fact. And that was a little, uh, so uh, Bruiser was on the couch uh, and Art came up and jumped up on his human, which can be a way of claiming, and Bruiser kind of lunged towards him. Now, there wasn't aggression, but it was a very fine, and I think that these dogs are heading down the road where it could turn into aggression. Right now, Art's only been in the house for a couple months. So, and I've had a lot of clients, they're buddies until one day, now they're trying to rip the flesh off each other. Sit. It happens. So the more that you apply order, and that looks good, uh, the more that you apply order and rules and structure, the more they see you acting like a leader. Um, so we'll come back to the rule. Well, actually, let me finish up the rules. So um, other rules, not be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food, um, having to sit at the door. I go to the door once and say sit. Uh, well, I go to the door and say sit once, I should say. And if the dog doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk away and sit down somewhere nearby. I wait one minute, then I go back to the door and command the dog to sit. Don't ask. If they don't sit this time within three seconds, I walk away and I sit down for two minutes. Next time I walk away and sit down for four minutes, then for eight minutes. I keep double the length of time when I walk away until eventually when I say sit, the dog sits. And as soon as the dog sits... Man, I fly the door open as fast as I can. Now, let's say that Art sits and Bruiser doesn't. Well, then I would open the door and let Art out, and Bruiser would not get that privilege. And I, he would have to wait for me to come back and give them privilege, uh, the command again. But this is a great, and I want you to think of this almost like as a formula. The dog can't go outside on its own. It needs your assistance. So that gives you leverage in the situation. Use the leverage to your advantage. Not punishing you, but the only way you get the reward is by doing something for me. I'm asking you the smallest thing you do as a dog and sit. And if you can't be bothered to sit, guess what, buddy? I can't be bothered to Crash. open that door. Awesome. Guardian's got passive training down like there's no tomorrow. Now, he's nudging for attention, and that's what a lot of dogs like to do. And this is a perfect time to talk about petting with a purpose. Now, he's squirting all over the Guardian right behind the camera. Uh, and he's cute, but... Again, it's still a demand for attention. So the dog comes up and nudges you for attention. It's telling you what to do. Remember, leaders tell, followers ask. So if he tells us what to do and we do it, that confuses him into thinking that he is in charge. Then when we don't listen for other things, that also confuses him. So it makes him frustrated. And the frustration can lead to the barking and the jumping up and a lot of the other things. So what we're going to do next time he nudges you or pause for attention, you're going to give the dog a counter order. Tell it to sit. If it's already sitting, tell it to sit over here or tell it to lie down. No more shakes. I would not practice the shake. And if he doesn't sit or doesn't lay down within three seconds, lean back, check out your mail, read something on your phone, show the dog, I got other things to do. Playing hard to get works great for dating. It works great for dogs. So if you can't be bothered to sit, again, I can't be bothered to pet you. After a while, he'll start thirsting for that sit. And what the dog will realize, when I tell the human what to do now, nothing happens. When they, when they tell me what to do, if I do it, I get rewarded. So the dog will start to think, I can't tell them what to do anymore. I have to ask. And better than ask, I have to have to pay for the privilege of their attention. And the way I pay for that is by offering uh, through a currency of obedience. So the dog will start coming up in front of you and sitting down to prepay for the attention or laying down. And when it does, make sure you pet it under its chin. Say the word just sit or just crash or whatever the word is just once. And then you pet it as much or as little as you want. So what your dog is doing now is learning this is the appropriate way to ask for attention. It's a lot more polite than jumping up on you and scratching. If you're wearing some nice clothes and the dog's been outside and they stepped in some poop, guess what? You got to do laundry. So teaching that's going to be hard because these dogs are used to jumping up. I went to the door when I was outside before I came inside. I told uh, Bruiser to sit and he started pogoing, jumping up and down because that's probably gotten him what he wants. So you're going to have to kind of really knuckle down for the next couple weeks but after about a week or two, the dogs will be like, she's changed. I do it her way or I don't get anything. And she is not asking me multiple times. She's not, you know, there's, it's this, her way or the highway. And after a while, and the dog's like, well, I'm the one outside. And every time my buddy does it, he gets petted. Well, maybe I should do it too. 
Um, a lot of us, we go out of our way to be fair when we have multiple dogs. I pull, if I pull out a treat, I better have two. Well, what I would do is the opposite. I would pull out one treat and say, come. Whoever comes and sits first gets the treat. Whoever comes second doesn't get a darn thing. Unless they offer the same, uh, if they offer the same performance level or same intensity, then I would break the treat in half and give them both one. But this creates a motivation to be obedient. Who can get there first and sit down? I want that treat. Right now, it's like, I get, you know, I didn't ask the guardian, but a lot of people are like, do you check that? I try to do this uh, by myself. So we have somebody coming to the door. We'll kind of shift a little bit. Um, there we go. All right. So um, we'll wait for the barking to subside a little bit. Okay. Oh, we got packages. It's 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 the holiday season. Okay. So basically, um, petting with a purpose and passive training are kind of two sides of the same coin. If we get in a habit of petting the dogs when they do the things that we want, they'll start offering that behavior. Like I talked about earlier, a lot of times uh, they come in and they jump up. I'll let you grab this and redo. Thank you. Well, it's still going. Um, but we reward them for the wrong things. Uh, good ex a couple examples. When I came in, one of the dogs was going to nip at us, and so the guardian picked the dog up. Well, that's a reward. The dog jumps up on us, we pet it. We're saying pet jumping up on me, which is what dog's way of claiming you is a reward. And I usually recommend no, no shake because dogs are like, if you like the shake, you must really like if I put both paws up on top of you. And again, that's how they claim people. So that can be confusing for dogs. Also, it can it fuses them into thinking, if I'm the leader, if I tell my humans to pet me and she does it, well, clearly I'm in charge of her. Then when she leaves or somebody comes in or walks by the street and she goes and talks to them anyway, she doesn't realize this is a dangerous part of town. She might get accosted. That bunny rabbit might take her wallet. So the dogs think just like we do. If you're a parent and your children are not listening to you, that makes you very frustrated and, and boisterous. And I can't think of the right word I'm looking for, but you're worried and concerned about them. And you might snap at them. And you might say something you regret saying later because you're so concerned for them. And that dogs, so we have kind of this perfect storm. We have dogs that probably need more exercise, didn't have any rules or structure, and got to get paid whenever, got paid whenever they wanted. If you ask yourself, if I had a job where my boss said, okay, there's no more rules for you, there's no more consequence because there's no rules, and whenever you feel like you've worked enough to get paid, you let me know and I'll cut you a check, no questions asked, I promise you, you'll love your job, but you'll be the worst employee that company has ever had because you don't have any motivation to listen to your humans. This is what almost all my clients do with all their dogs. So now we're gonna create that motivation. If I want that, that attention, I better sit. And remember if the dog's barking at you like crazy, don't even look at it, don't shove it off, just sit there. Jumps up on you, just cross your arms and lean back, look at the ceiling. When the dog jumps down, tell it to sit. When it sits and tell it to crash, and then when it crashes, it does the second movement, second command, I pet it for doing that. If it jumps up on you and you say off, and it gets off, and you pet it say off, it's just gonna jump back up to get that off again. So it'll take a little bit of practice, but eventually you'll get in the habit of doing it. Since you're, uh, the guardian here doesn't have anybody else in the house to help her uh, remember these things, I would put little post-it notes around. Sit at the door, you know, uh, you know, petting with a purpose. So just in different parts of your house, you look up, you're like, oh yeah. And if you catch yourself, the dog jumps up on you, you start petting, catch yourself, stop. And then say, sit. The dog sits, pet her on the chin and say, sit. If it doesn't, stop petting it. I have that effect on most women. <laughs> She's yawning. Um, all right, so let me see. We also went over the escalated consequences. If you forget what those are, let me know and I can go over those uh, with you separately or I can share a video. That's one of those things you have to hire me for. Um, but practice those exercises. Um, for dog training, you want to practice exercise, you want to practice exercise or the uh, training, whatever it is, for less than three minutes per practice session. I usually recommend 90 seconds. Once you get past 90 seconds, you'll start getting more failures. The neurons start getting fatigued. The dog starts performing less. Well, you get frustrated and the dog's like, well, last time we did that, I don't, you got frustrated. I wanted to practice that again. Make sure after practicing the exercise, you try to always end on a good one. And then give it a little belly rub. You do whatever it is. And this is a wonderful opportunity for you to practice with one dog. You have the other dog back there. And then you get done practicing with that dog. Play with it a little minute. Then put it outside to do a potty break. Then go practice letting the, door, the dog out that door, the calm exercise. The more these dogs practice being calm to get a reward or get something, the more they're going to emulate that behavior. The more that they have self-control, the less bombastic and barking. And a lot of the problems that you have are going to subside. It doesn't seem like it's a straight line between the two, but it's really rules and structure. Dogs that bark, what the rule book says is not being allowed in the furniture because the higher they sit, the more rancor status they have and no more free pets. So even if you want to pet your dog, you're going to still tell it to sit. If it doesn't, it doesn't give the privilege of your attention. 
All right, going back to rules, um, door is one of them. Not be allowed to be within the seven feet of the human who's eating would be another one. Not be allowed in the kitchen where we're preparing food. Not being allowed in the furniture, and you get those X mats. I'd probably move your ottoman up so they just can't sit on it temporarily. And then get a couple X mats. They're about 11 or 12 bucks a piece on shoe. You probably need about four of them. But this way you put them up here. That way you're sitting here. And if the dog, you know, or if you're in your bedroom, the dog's running out here, I'm just going to sit up here. Well, no, I can't because the X mats are going to make it uncomfortable. And if you want to use, uh, teach the dog to go to a dog bed, message me. I have videos for that I can share as well. So anything else that we cover that you want me to go over? Um, there's probably a lot of things that we, we cover a lot in three plus hours. So remember, if you have any questions, please text me. Um, if I don't hear from you, I assume everything's going great. And uh, I want to be here to help you. And I can only do that if you let me know. All right, well, normally I would say this is uh, Bruiser and this is Art, but they're outside barking saying, we're out here, damn it, and this is their roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you move.